I am going to read up the second poem in my chapbook, which I've never read before, so it could be rough going, because one has a way of looking down upon these things and wondering who wrote them. <laughs> I brought the large print edition, though, because I was trying to see the chapbook. Right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, anyway, it's really um, very much a privilege to have been published by Cantonary, which is a beautiful new venture. Um, so this is called Foyer States, or Foyer States, if you want the English pronunciation. Um, and it's a poem in three parts. It was the rain, thrumming away the months of her locked-up life, a protectress against the new-made frowns of the power-mad disciplinarians. By a woman with money whose father loved her, or at least couldn't bear to cut the thread, Hermione, too, was protected, child of Helen in hatred, she did not put a stop to history, but rather remembered it differently, the details, the proprioception of the accidental child moving inside her body, the touch of vibrating air against her rounded eardrum, damp hair wound down the back, then wrapped in a towel on a cold afternoon right before the end of the war. There's a rock in the distance she never thought to climb, an ocean that spoke directly to her. And where is he? Her seemingly private pleasures pain him. How could it be so simple? But it was, even for him, who wanted nothing more than a selfless caress, but felt obliged by official, official music to take up the call of battle. Her pleasure offended, given the times. Others should be warned. She wandered down the marsh as he took up the search, search for martyrs. The ghostly sound of a lonely poet who bore the tedium admirably dresses these words in outdated for formality. The existential that would destroy the sensual vies with the tyranny of feeling, looks for meaning. Is it so wrong? I can endow any moment with pathos, she thought. I am this privileged and I am this poor. I have forgotten the past and yet I am trapped in it. My husband sleeps for years at a time. And when he's awake, he's laughing and grateful. His contentment disrupts the buried person shuffling forward to meet me, the portals forced by dissatisfied energies through which the muffled voices come. Have I been making them up? I used to hear them in every voice, the story of a failed state, a cry of lost potential. That was a mirror of my fears. Now I hear something different, more terrifying and more grand. Who am I to interpret these signs? Swooning shapes of being, leaving messages in silt. The ocean's ambivalent song. Even the extraordinary life lacks what's needed to take it all in. She sinks back down into the fabric and tries to feel consciousness end, embrace the rain. She thinks of the anarchy of the aged woman freed of all constraint. Finally, I can breathe. Just as Hermione climbed the wall in order to look down on Achilles, she built no worker's utopias in verse to assuage the hatred of having a mind, but understood the privilege. She listened to fate and saw its face, a woman holding a dying soldier, a lover, a mother. It makes no difference. The solace of woman's flesh, shredded by pointless death. To hide their murderous exploits, Experts punished the girl, Eurydice bitten into lament. It was her fault. Her unedited sweetness demanded ending. Aristeus followed suit. Loveliness, he believed, must be consumed. The thoughts of a man, was he really a man, who caused the death of all his bees? It was Hermione who told us that when in death Eurydice missed only the scent of Earth's flowers, had forgotten her husband's song. Is it true? A gray light, just like the light of this rainy day, played backdrop to her Elysium. The rain, the rain. But this rain is no Elysium, she thought. It is tedious feeling, a banal peace with the fact of existence. She reached up and felt the box around her. It was pliable and warm, a body of air. Is it okay to whisper an uplifting message through the hollow substance of these walls, even 
if no one is listening. Someday, somebody will be. As she heard Hermione singing, the broken voice of the diva refusing to leave the stage, finally alive, even before institutionalized, Hermione imagined all handsome young men, her passionate suitors. She knew herself to be like this, prone to dreaming in narratives more fascinating than the facts at hand. It was as simple as a fringed scarf thrown over the camel back of a worn sofa, a blood orange box with gold detail left on the mantelpiece of a dead fireplace, holding one black cigarette, a mirror that could threaten to deflect it. Yet the damp morning protected the visual frameworks in her mind, bookish weather. She remembered a time when every feeling was as palpable as the chair she was sitting in. They tripped so easily into lyric puzzles, jumped over ho-hum grammatical knots, beautiful patterns for the ear of the beloved. There was no story that could not be altered by the impulse of a moment. Now through the window, the hydrangea waves as if to say, just keep still. The bees and the butterflies will come to you. But never say butterfly in a poem, <laughs> she thought, minding the disciplinarians. Injunctions whispered in rooms where her poems were being read. Were there really such rooms? Or were they like Hermione's lovers, punctilios lining the outer edges of the damaged ego's edifice? Rain slapped the concrete, a wet chemical heat. This weather is not willed by the mind, she thought, any more than the sun bleaches and calms, because I wish it to do so. Then she felt a slight dampness in her hair falling down her neck. It made her think, I have made this all up. As once when she tried to move the signs, an umbrella a thoughtless stranger had given her suddenly changed into an Orphic liar. That's when the singing began. It was as real as Hildegard's conviction that through the intricate language of image, God was speaking directly to her. Whether it was real or imagined mattered less than the direction it came from, an object quivering with unrecorded motion. The mind needs the world to relieve it of self. Conversely, the material world needs the mind simply because the mind exists. With its removal of breaking the current, an ear without interpreter, an eye all unafraid. Dream thrown by the smell of wisteria, she will convene with Hermione in her sleep, await a visitation. She will cal calculate the economics of the imagination in the dark and on one hand. No conjuring of metaphysical content through a heavy literalness regarding the day. In her love of essence, she is out of fashion. Artificial light and noise, the great threats. Without the various silence, her thoughts will cower in shadow. Neither shall her nerves know the sylvan violence that drove us back into the cave, there where we conjured with a bit of stain the manifold dimensions of being. Was this before the songs were stifled to stop a siren singing? It continues, she thought this hatred of beauty, of unedited joy. Why struggle against them? They convince, just as the floaty Lillian Gish embodied how Hester Prynne irked the crabbed soul of an entire village by becoming the songbird she chased. Another instance of Eurydice's foot pressing the meadow's threshold, releasing the intelligence of the sensual, convening with she who sings and knows. Hermione channeled Helen not to destroy him, but to see her anew, counter-direction of the usual tra trajectory. It is the delicate echo of the minor effort echoing off ancient bedrock, a song not of ought to, but of yes. Thank you.